Welcome to today's program titled Time Well Spent, Session 5, Exploring the FLSA's Core Exemptions. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to all attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. This presentation has been prepared by Seifarth Shaw LLP for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Kelly Kelker. Kelly, please go ahead. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, wherever you may be. And thank you so much for joining us for this, the fifth session of our webinar series, Time Well Spent. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Kelly Kelker. And one of my jobs here at SciFarth is to update twice a year uh, the treatise entitled Wage Hour Class and Collective Actions, published by ALM, that is primarily authored by SciFarth attorneys under the leadership of our three editors in chief, partners Brett Bartlett in Atlanta, Noah Finkel in Chicago, and Andrew Paley in Los Angeles. As with the prior sessions, my role here today is to help move things along so that we can cover in the next 45 minutes all of the current topics and developments in the area of exemptions to the FLA's overtime and, and uh, minimum wage requirements. We have a tremendous uh, set of speakers here today with uh, fantastic uh, PowerPoints to share with you. And I'm fortunate to introduce those two attorneys that will be leading this um, presentation today. Uh, first, we have Kevin Young, who's a partner in our Atlanta office. Kevin works with clients across a range of industries from retail to hospitality to staffing to oil and gas. And his work includes both defense of wage and hour class and collective actions, as well as counseling on day to day employment issues, including, but not limited to wage and hour matters. One interesting thing about Kevin's practice is that he is highly focused on innovation and the use of artificial intelligence. In the legal practice, indeed, he, he teaches a class in that area at the University of Georgia School of Law, um, and he also helps lead the firm's internal efforts in that area. Also joining us is Elizabeth McGregor, who is a partner in our San Francisco office, where her practice also focuses on wage and hour class actions, as well as PAGA actions that those of you joining us in California may be well familiar with. And she also advises employers on wage and hour compliance. And she represents clients in many industries with a particular focus on the healthcare sector. Uh, Kevin, can you please kick us off with an introduction to the white collar and non white collar FLSA exemptions? Happy to do so. Thanks so much, uh, Kelly, Kate, and thanks to all you for being here. Uh, I, I know I speak for Elizabeth as well when I say we're excited to share this time with you and to cover uh, the very uh, important uh, stress inducing litigation causing topic of the FLSA's uh, minimum wage and overtime exemptions. Uh, just very rough agenda for today. We do have a lot of content. We're going to try to move through it as expeditiously as we can and focus on the stuff that seems most important. We'll start with a quick overview of the wage and hour landscape that these exemption issues fit into. And then we'll turn really into the meat of the federal exemptions, both the pay requirements that the core exemptions have as well as the duties requirements that they entail. We'll end by, by uh, giving a reminder on some of the state law distinctions, some of the, the states uh, where exemptions to state overtime laws differ a bit from what we see under the federal law, uh, just so that we can make sure that things are as complicated as possible. Um, we'll go right into the landscape and uh, next slide would be great. I mean, perfect. So very quick background, probably not needed for a lot of the folks 
on this call, but when we talk about the Federal uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA, uh, we are talking about pretty dated legislation. We're talking about a piece of legislation that was enacted at the height of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Um, you can imagine, I mean, the workplace today looks different than it looked 30 years ago, much less, you know, almost 100 years ago. It was a, a manufacturing driven economy back then, and now we are far more of a service based economy, a technology driven economy. And because of that, we deal with a law that was written for a very different time, uh, a very different workplace, very different style of work. The FLSA at its core has always had uh, three main areas of focus. Um, one is the regulation of child labor or youth employment. Um, another is uh, minimum wage uh, paid to employees across the work week. And the third, of course, is the payment of overtime to eligible employees, to non-exempt employees uh, for, for hours worked in excess of 40 per week. Uh, next slide, please. So with these graphs, you know, we, we don't need to go into the exact numbers. The main point, FLSA litigation is a real thorn in the side for a lot of employers. Um, we see about 6,000 cases uh, filed under the FLSA in federal court per year. And that's just the federal cases. It doesn't include state law cases, doesn't include arbitrations, um, doesn't include uh, demand letters that might be settled uh, pre-suit. So this is you know, the issues under the FLSA pop up a lot. You know, why do they pop up a lot? I think number one, you know, we are dealing with an inherently vague law, again, written for a very different time. Um, secondly, look, you know, it, it's attractive to plaintiff's attorneys to bring suits under this law. Uh, the FLSA provides a pretty easy path to class certification of otherwise individual claims, uh, provides a path to liquidated damages, and importantly, provides a path to attorney's fees for a prevailing party. Uh, next slide, please. The claims that are really driving these trends, they break into three buckets. We see regular rate claims basic, basically saying, look, you, you, you paid me overtime, but you calculated it wrong. Um, more and more with employees working remotely um, and in all sorts of places outside of, of the traditional workplace, we see hours worked claims, you know, saying, look, you paid me, but not for enough hours. You know, I, I worked pre-shift, post-shift, while I was, you know, walking my dog, whatever the case may be. So we see lots of claims in that bucket. And then relevant here today, we see certainly a lot of misclassification claims. Claims saying, look, you classified me as exempt, but you got it wrong. You got it wrong because I didn't perform exempt duties or you didn't pay me in the appropriate way or for some other reason. And so we wanna focus on that bucket on the exemptions that drive the misclassification claims today. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll turn it to Elizabeth. Thank you. So could we have the next slide, please? There are many exemptions from overtime under the FLSA. The ones we're going to talk about today are the most common. The executive, administrative, and professional exemptions, as well as others, the highly compensated employee exemption, outside sales, computer professional, and the Motor Carrier Act exemption. Uh, one factor that's needed to meet the test for nearly all of these exemptions is the level of compensation an employee receives, which is known as the salary level and salary basis test. Uh, next slide, please. To meet the required salary level for an exempt employee under the FLSA, the employee must receive $684 or more per week, or $35,568 per year. And that amount can't be reduced by the quality or the quantity of an employee's work. So if the employee performs any work in a, a work week, the employee has to be, receive his or her full salary. The federal regulations allow for employee, employers to use non-discretionary bonuses or incentive payments to satisfy up to at least 10% of the employee's annual salary. And if the employee doesn't earn enough in the non-discretionary bonus or incentive payments, the employer is allowed to make a catch-up payment at the end of the year to bring the employee up to that salary basis. On uh, September 8, 2023, the Department of Labor published its proposed rule to increase the minimum salary level for white-collar exemptions to $55,068 per year or $1,059 per week. And under the proposed rule, the highly compensated employee exemption would increase from $107,432 to $143,988. And that rule also includes a proposal that would implement a triannual uh, automatic update of the salary threshold to align with uh, shifts in worker salaries uh, and to provide employers with a predictable time frame for future increases. Uh, under the salary basis test, employers are allowed to pay uh, additional compensation over and above a predetermined amount without jeopardizing the employee's exempt status. 
So as long as the employee is receiving that minimum of $684 per week, the employee can also receive additional compensation in the form of commissions or percentages of sales or profits of the employer. And the employee can also receive hourly compensation uh, for work done beyond the regularly scheduled work week um, without jeopardizing the exemption as well. However, in the past, the Department of Labor has taken the position that the salary basis could be compromised if an employee's pay is calculated by the hour, day, or piece, and the employee is also receiving a guaranteed minimum, but the total compensation doesn't correspond and doesn't, doesn't have a reasonable relationship to the amount actually earned. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Kevin to talk about the reasonable relationship issue. Sure. Yeah. And, and you know, reasonable relationship. Um, it is, it's a topic that's gotten a lot of buzz over the past couple of years because it was the focus in part of a Supreme Court case called uh, Helix Energy Solutions versus Hewitt. Um, it's not every day that we see FLSA issues make their way um, to the Supreme Court, so, so certainly it rightly got some attention. Um, the, the gist of, of this reasonable relationship requirement, well, let me start here. The regulations around this space are horribly written. They're very difficult to discern, and even with the Supreme Court weighing in, there's still some... Uh, issues around how these rules should be interpreted that left to be or that, that remain to be seen. But at a minimum, what the rules say is, look, you can pay an exempt employee by the hour, by the day, by the piece, as long as they get a guaranteed minimum of at least the minimum salary level. And in that event, there must be a reasonable relationship between their take home pay and the guaranteed amount. What the Department of Labor has said in sub regulatory guidance over the years is that a reasonable relationship means essentially that the guaranteed compensation is at least about two thirds of the employee's take home pay. Um, this came to head in this Hewitt uh, Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court issued its decision about a year ago, give or take a couple of weeks. That case involved an employee who was paid a day rate of $1,000 per day. Um, he took home well over $200,000 per year. And the question was whether he satisfied the requirements to be exempt. His duties were not in question, only the pay was in question. And a 6 3 uh, Supreme Court ruled that this individual was entitled to overtime, that he was not properly classified as exempt because he was not paid on a salary basis. And the main point that the court made was look, you know, you paid him by the day. $1,000 a day, even though it's a lot of money, is still a day rate basis of pay. Therefore, you have to satisfy a reasonable relationship. And this guy was working like five, six days a week when he worked. So by definition, he might have $1,000 guaranteed to him if he worked one minute in one week. But he was typically earning $5,000, $6,000 a week, you know, five, six times more than the guarantee. And the court said, look, that does not satisfy salary basis. His take-home pay is not reasonably related to his guaranteed pay. Therefore, he doesn't meet the salary basis. Uh, requirement that it's spelled out under these very complex and convoluted regulations. The takeaway from Helix is that, yes, a Supreme Court will find that a $200,000 employee making $1,000 a day, despite their high comp, can be entitled to overtime. That's right. And so the, it just drives home the point that the salary basis test is very important to pay attention to because you can have a very highly compensated employee who is nevertheless determined to be non exempt. Um, can we have the next slide, please? The one issue that can jeopardize the salary basis is uh, the issue of deductions from pay. So as noted earlier, an, employer, an employee has to receive his or her full salary for the week without deductions for quantity or quality of work. Uh, but there are certain deductions that are permissible. An employer does not need to pay an employee for any week in which no work is performed. And the employer is not required to pay the full salary in the first or last week of an employee's employment, but can do a prorated salary in, in those two weeks. Apart from that, uh, deductions from personal absences are allowed if they're one or more full days and uh, due for personal reasons other than sickness or disability. Deductions can't be made for absences occasioned by the employer. So for example, if there's no work to be performed, uh, but the employee's ready to work, the employee has to receive the full salary in that week. Or if the employer's uh, business is shut down because of inclement weather, the employee still has to receive pay uh, for that as well. Uh, an employer can also make deductions for uh, absences caused by sickness or disability, uh, including work-related accidents, if the deductions are made in accordance with a bona fide plan, policy, or practice of providing compensation for loss of salary. 
occasioned by such sickness or disability. Um, in order for a sick leave plan to be bona fide, uh, it has to, uh, there have to be defined sick leave benefits. The benefits have to have been communicated to eligible employees. The plan has to operate as described. It has to be administered impartially, and its design um, does not reflect an effort to evade the requirements to pay the employee on a salary basis. Uh, employers, in some circumstances, can also make deductions for disciplinary reasons. The deductions can take the form of penalties for violations of safety rules of major significance or unpaid suspensions for serious violations of workplace conduct rules. The safety rules of major significance are those relating to the prevention of serious danger in the workplace, such as rules of, against smoking near explosives, um, things of that nature. And employers can also take deductions from salary for unpaid full-day disciplinary suspensions for serious violations of workplace conduct rules, such as rules prohibiting sexual harassment. That would not include uh, performance or attendance issues, so it has to be workplace conduct. And um, the, the disciplinary suspension has to be in full-day increments. It can't be partial-day increments. And it has to be pursuant to a written policy applicable to all employees. Employers can also make deductions pursuant to the FMLA. Uh, and in that case, the deductions can be in partial day increments if the employee is on intermittent FMLA. But importantly, that's tied to FMLA. So if the employer's policy allows uh, more generous leave than the FMLA, or if it's an accommodation pursuant to the Americans with Disability Act, partial days partial day deductions can't be made in those circumstances. And a related issue is deductions from vacation or leave banks. An employer can make partial day deductions from leave banks as long as the employee is receiving that vacation pay and gets the full salary basis for a work week. Um, next slide, please. And as mentioned before, there can be serious consequences if an employee uh, doesn't meet the salary basis. So there is exposure for improper deductions. Uh, and um, that occurs if the employer has an actual practice of making improper deductions, the employee can lose the exempt status and, and will be treated as non-exempt. The federal regulations provide certain factors to consider in determining whether the employer has such a practice. Those factors include the number of improper deductions, the length of time uh, during which the employer made those deductions, the number and geographic location of employees whose salary was reduced and managers responsible for making the deductions, and whether the employer has a clearly communicated policy permitting or prohibiting improper deductions. Courts have found that a few isolated examples of improper deductions won't result in a loss of exemption, the exempt status, uh, but if, the, if it's found that the employer was making a consistent improper deductions, it could jeopardize, the employee will lose the exempt status, but it could also jeopardize the exempt status of other employees in that job classification who are under that same manager for that same time period, regardless of whether or not those employees had improper deductions. So it could have much broader consequences to the employer. The Department of Labor provides employers with a defense in the case of impermissible deductions. Uh, an employer won't lose the exemption if the employer has a clearly communicated policy that prohibits improper deductions and includes a complaint mechanism, reimburses the employees for the improper deductions, and makes a good faith commitment to comply in the future. However, if the employer continues to make uh, improper deductions willfully after receiving employee complaints, the employer will lose the exemption. And now I'll turn it over to Kevin for a discussion of the duties test. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and, and just a quick point on the safe harbor. Um, as we said at the outset, so we're not here to give legal advice to any uh, one person or, or company, but I will just say I cannot think of a good reason not to have a salary safe harbor policy in place, a policy like what's described here on the screen, a policy that says, hey, we won't allow improper deductions from your salary if you're exempt. If you see one, come tell us, we'll investigate, we'll take care of it. Um, it is it's something that really makes sense for any employer that's covered by the FLSA, which is most employers these days. Um, next slide, please. Okay. so. We'll talk about the exemptions duties requirements and again, this is probably known to everyone here, but I think just a level of set um, I'll, I'll offer this. Um, the way I describe it a lot is, you know, you could have an employee whose uh, primary duty, their main duty is mowing lawns and he or she could be paid $300,000 a year. And he or she is not exempt because while they have the pay, they don't have the duties. 
You could also, I guess, have a, a CEO who makes $5 an hour and that's it. And he or she also doesn't have the core exemptions because even though a CEO clearly has the duties, that person doesn't have the pay. You have to have the pay, you have to have the duties to meet these exemptions that we're talking about. Elizabeth and I were talking about this yesterday during a prep and in you know, most cases, most issues under the FLSA come up under the duties test. Um, most claims, you know, I was misclassified are usually coming up under, well, my duties weren't exempt. So let's talk about, you know, what does that mean? When we're talking about the exemptions today, the main exemptions we're talking about are what you hear referred to as the EAP exemptions or the white collar exemptions or sometimes the 541 exemptions because they're in part 541 of the, the of the labor title in the Code of Federal Regulations. But ultimately, these are the EAP executive administrative professional exemptions. Each of these exemptions starts with asking, well, what is the employee's primary duty? And so defining what primary duty is, is very important. Under the federal law, um, unlike in California, as you'll we'll hear from Elizabeth a little bit later, the, the primary duty test is qualitative, not quantitative. So it's qualitative, it says, well, what's the most important thing that this individual does? Not where does most of their time go, although time is certainly relevant, it's what is their main value? You know, why are they here? Um, what is their primary purpose? Um, there are a lot of factors that, that the Department of Labor, the lawyers, and that, that ultimately judges or arbitrators look at when they're assessing a dispute over what the employee's primary duty was. Um, we've got the main ones here. Certainly time can be relevant, but it's not dispositive. We look also at, you know, when the employee is doing whatever the, 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 the alleged primary duty is, how free from direct supervision are they? Like, do they have the leeway to just go do that thing? And then also, you know, what's the importance of that, that potential primary duty relative to the other duties that the individual performs? You know, if it's a store manager in a convenience store, they might sometimes hold the mop or sweep the floor, that sort of thing. But how important is that relative to the other managerial things that they do, like setting the schedule and dealing with disciplinary issues and things like that? So you're looking at not just where does the time go or what do they do minute to minute, moment to moment, but what's the most important thing that they do? Um, you know, a, a tip in this space, you know, you want to be able with your exempt jobs to really build a compelling case about what primary duty is. If you've got a job that, that's classified as exempt, the last thing you want to see is, like, let's say it's a manager, you don't want to see performance evaluations that talk about their success in, uh, you know, sweeping floors. Um, you don't want to see a job description that emphasizes that sort of thing. If you see counseling, usually you'd want to see it on things like you didn't manage the store well and less about like, you know, you didn't change out the light bulb timely, that sort of thing. Um, next slide, please. So moving into the, to, to the, the real nitty gritty of, of these EAP exemptions, again, there are three main ones, three main EAP or white collar exemptions. Um, one is the executive, the other is administrative, the other is professional. Um, we'll talk about them briefly here and then go into more detail on these requirements in the following slides. The executive is really for an employee whose main duty, whose primary duty is management, management of a team, management of a department, a subdivision of the company. They have to be directing the work of two or more people, and they have to have authority in hiring or firing decisions or similar decisions about the advancement of employees, promotions, raises, things like that. Um, the administrative exemption is the grayest exemption. It is the most litigated exemption. It's difficult to really um, put clear contours around, but we have to because it's a very commonly used and applicable exemption. The administrative is for an employee whose main work is office work or non-manual work that's related to managing the business or the business's operations or even to the operations of the business's customers. And we'll talk a little bit about that. In addition, whatever that primary duty is, if it's something in the area of HR or compensation or accounting or, or uh, personnel management, there has to be the inclusion of some discretion and independent judgment for that employee with respect to important matters. And we'll talk about what that means. Lastly, there's the professional exemption. Um, there's a lot of requirements around this one, but the gist of it is you know, we're really thinking about professions like lawyers, engineers, doctors, registered nurses, architects, jobs that usually require a distinct type of advanced training to enter into the job and perform the duties of the job. Um, so with that, we'll drill a little bit uh, further into these exemptions on the next slide, starting with the executive. Um, so for an executive, an executive exemption employee, the primary duty has to involve 
uh, management and management of a department, a subdivision can be a team if the team is fairly static. You know, the team kind of stays with the manager. Um, things that show that you know a, a primary duty of management are a lot of the things you would traditionally think about. You know, what does a manager do? They might interview employees or candidates. They might train people. They would manage a schedule. They would say, you know, here's what's happening for the day. You're going to go here. You're going to go there. Um, they would receive complaints about you know things that employees under their watch are seeing or experiencing day to day. Um, it's really going into managing the work to be done, not just for the executive exempt employee, him or herself, but for other employees who they oversee. I have, or we have in some, some of these teal boxes on these um, slides, pretty extreme examples of some of the things you might hear that would cause concern under these various requirements. You know, here, like things like, well, yeah, I manage the budget and that's managerial, but it's just like, I don't even touch it. You know, it's set for me. And if I want to change it, I just send it to somebody else, that sort of thing. Or, um, you know, I don't make the decisions, my supervisor does. You know, I'm just here to kind of execute on what they tell me to do. Or like the worst of all, you hear it sometimes is, I don't really manage anything, but I know that they don't have to pay me overtime. And that's why I'm here. I mean, again, very extreme examples, but some of the things you hear when individuals challenge their exempt classification under this requirement. Um, next slide, please. In addition, um, an employee under the executive exemption has to customarily and regularly direct the work of two or more full-time employees. It needs to be two or more full-time employees or their equivalent. So it could be, you, know, you, you lawyers hate math, but I can do this math. Like four part-time employees generally would equal two full-time employees. So it has to be two full-timers or the equivalent of two full-time employees who are directed regularly by this manager. Regularly, you know, the point I would call out on that is it's not someone who manages two or more people just when their manager is out, you know, like they stand in, they're the, they're the backup manager. It's someone who like on a week to week basis is really responsible for directing these two individuals or the equivalent of two full-time individuals. Doesn't need to be every hour, doesn't even need to be every day, but it does need to be regular rather than sporadic. Next slide, please. The, the final duties requirement on the executive exemption is that the individual has to be involved in hiring or firing or even promotion decisions. The best evidence is that the individual who you're claiming the exemption for actually makes those decisions. They have the authority to go hire someone or to fire someone or to promote someone. But as we all know, like in a lot of businesses, you know, even very high level managers don't have that final say. There's a process, recommendations are made, inputs given, and there's more of a, a collaboration around who gets hired or who gets terminated, especially, and even who gets promoted. That can be okay. You know, making recommendations around hiring or firing or promotions can be enough, but it's important that you're able to show that that's that making the recommendations is really part of the manager's responsibility and that their recommendations are given weight. You know, if, if the manager could come in and plausibly say, look, I made 10 recommendations over the course of two years and I was, they were never followed and they didn't even tell me why. I mean, that's really bad evidence. If you came in and said and said, yeah, they made 10 recommendations, we followed seven of them. Three of them we didn't meet and we told them why, you know, they didn't follow our process. They hadn't done any written discipline, whatever the case may be. That's a lot better. I mean, that can show that, yes, like the recommendations are typically followed. They're involved in the process and we care enough about the recommendations that even when we don't follow them, we're telling them why and making sure that they feel part of the process. Um, next slide, please. So I want to talk next about the administrative exemption. The administrative exemption could be its own presentation and it could last two hours. Um, there is so much grayness to this exemption and because there's so much grayness, there's so much litigation around this exemption. But, but the, the idea of it is that this exemption is for an employee whose primary or again, most important duty has them either in the office or doing non-manual work, like not turning wrenches, not you know erecting a building, putting up ladders, things like that. And that work needs to be directly related to the employer's management or business operations or the management or business operations of the employer's customers. Think of this as kind of you know, people who don't really so much do the business, but help to administer or drive the business or service the business. HR, advertising, 
uh, marketing, um, you know, uh, uh, personnel management, um, accounting, finance, audit, tax, things like that. Things that usually are not typically um, the business itself, but really helping them make the business go. That's what this requirement is really getting at. Um, where you see a lot of litigation pop up under this requirement is where someone comes in and says, well, I don't help to really make any part of the business go. I'm not helping to administer anything or drive anything. I'm a producer. I produce what our business does or I sell what our business does. That's not always a death knell. I mean, there, there is nuance to that type of argument, but that type of, that type of argument can be troubling and certainly can stir up litigation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next requirement in this notoriously gray <laughs> exemption, um, the next duties requirement, I should say, is that the primary duty, again, that most important duty that the individual performs must include using discretion and independent judgment with respect to important matters. It's almost like the Department of Labor got together and said, how can we make this as vague as possible? And this is what they put out there. But there's, there's some rules around this and there's some case law around it. It certainly gives us some direction on what this means. Um, what this is getting at, what this requirement is getting at is you want someone who has the ability to, to look at different courses of conduct, you know, which way could we go here? And then to decide after considering what those potential options are. Being able to make decisions where multiple options are available is great. Recommendations can be okay too, but it kind of looks a little bit like the hiring and firing piece on the executive exemption. You wanna make sure that it's really part of that individual's uh, job to make those recommendations and that those recommendations are afforded significant weight. In other words, like that person's supposed to be at the table being part of these decisions. Um, some of the factors that you'll see judges and the Department of Labor look at when you're assessing, you know, does an, a, an administrative employees include discretion and independent judgment will include, you know, can they negotiate and bind the company? Um, do they handle any major projects or business objectives that we're working on? Do they consult management of the business or, or uh, clients on in, in a sort of like an expert capacity? Um, and certainly, you know, are they handling uh, major uh, investigations or other kind of one off special projects on behalf of management? Where you see a lot of uh, litigation pop up in this area is where you see folks who come in and say, look, I just do keystrokes or everything I do is, is dictated by the protocol, that sort of thing. Um, next slide, please, and we'll talk quickly about professional exemption. The professional exemption, again, we're thinking engineers, doctors, lawyers, um, architects, uh, CPAs, uh, jobs that really are considered professional in nature that usually have an advanced training requirement uh, to enter that job. These are jobs that are primarily intellectual in nature. Um, whatever you know, experience and training they have is used usually to analyze, to interpret, things like that. Um, and it's and it's again it's in a field of science, a field of learning, like medicine, like science, like architecture, like engineering. A, a red flag in this area can be someone who might have the degree, might be a lawyer, but they don't do the work of a lawyer, or might be a doctor, but they're just a salesperson, that sort of thing. So common mistake is well, yeah, like this person has the training. It's not just having the training and having the license; it's using it to perform the primary work. Um, next slide, please. Um, whatever you know, the primary duty is for the professional exempt employee, it needs to be acquired or should customarily be acquired, I should say, through prolonged education. Usually, you know, what's best evidence here is a bachelor's or even a, you know, really more often a master's or professional degree in a specific area. It's the kind of job that says not just like a bachelor's in anything is fine, but we need like a master's in X, in engineering, in computer science, that sort of thing. Next slide, please, and we'll talk about some other exemptions, and I'll turn it to Elizabeth. Yes, so uh, as you probably gathered, the executive, administrative, and professional are the big exemptions that come up. Uh, those are the ones you see most frequently. However, there are additional exemptions to be aware of, and we're going to quickly talk about outside sales, computer, highly compensated employee, and the Motor Carry Act exemption. Next slide, please. To qualify for the outside sales exemption under federal law, uh, the employee has to satisfy Two criteria. First, the employee has to be employed to either make sales or obtain orders or contracts for services for the use of facilities, uh, services or the use of facilities. 
And the employee has to be customarily and regularly engaged away from the employer's place of business. And this is an interesting exemption because uh, there's no salary basis requirement for this one. So yeah, you don't have to deal with that. You just have to meet those two criteria. With respect to the first criteria of making sales, that can include any sale, exchange, contract to sell, consignment for sale, shipment for sale, or other transaction involving uh, goods, and can also involve the transfer of uh, property titles. Uh, and but the application restricts the exemption to employees who are primarily engaged, their primary duty is engaged in sales. Uh, but that can include uh, activities that are incidental to sales activities, such as um, writing, writing sales reports, attending sales conferences, uh, that sort of duty will count towards the exemption. Uh, with respect to the second criteria, the employee has to be regularly away from the employer's place of business, and that includes if the employee is working from home, that would qualify as the employer's place of business. So they have to be out making the sales. But uh, the Department of Labor has held that not all sales activities have to be done outside the employer's business so long as the employee is customarily and regularly engaged um, away from the employee's business. Uh, next slide, please. There's also the computer professional exemption. This one requires a, a salary basis of either $684 a week or that the employee's paid at an hourly rate of $27.63. Uh, the work has to be uh, done as an analyst, software engineer, or programmer, and the primary duty has to consist of one of these points, um, application of systems analysis techniques and procedures, including consulting with users to determine hardware, software, or system functional uh, specifications, design development, documentation, analysis, creation, testing, or modification of systems or programs, uh, based on or related to user or system design specifications. Design, documentation, testing, creation, or modification of computer programs related to machine operating systems, or a combination of those duties. It's not enough that an employee has a highly specialized knowledge of computers. The employee has to actively be engaged in designing or coding or testing computer programs. And the exemption doesn't cover people whose job duty is manufacturing computers or repairing computers. And it doesn't include employees whose work is highly dependent on computers, such as uh, an engineer or a drafter who might be using uh, software programs. Uh, they would not qualify under this exemption. Uh, next slide, please. Now I'll turn it over to Kevin for uh, the highly compensated employee. Sure. Um, we'll talk about the Motor Carrier Act exemption and then the highly compensated exemption to round out the FLSA exemptions we're talking about. Really quickly, I should have mentioned before, too, the duties tests are not, there, there's no proposed change on the table for those. As Elizabeth mentioned, there is a proposed change on the table for the salary level, but the Department of Labor has not proposed to change the duties test. I just want to put that out there in case anyone was wondering. Um, we'll talk quickly about the Motor Carrier Act exemption. Again, a fairly thorny exemption, and it doesn't apply to everyone, but for some businesses, it's quite important. Um, the gist of this exemption of this exemption is the Department of Labor is saying, look, if the Department of Transportation is regulating hours, for certain individuals, then we're not going to also get into the mix of regulating their hours through overtime requirements. Of course, they don't say it quite that simply. Instead, there are some requirements you have to really meet in order to avail yourself of this exemption. Um, the main point that, that I would emphasize is, is what's number two on the screen. This is for employees who are drivers, driver's helpers, loaders, or mechanics, typically on vehicles weighing in excess of 10,000 pounds. And those vehicles must be used on public roads in interstate commerce, so across state lines. Um, certainly, you know, the easy example is the truck driver who's crossing from Florida into Georgia to Alabama, so on and so forth. Um, they're clearly crossing interstate, um, and, and so that requirement usually would not be too hard to meet. You do see cases involving um, drivers, driver's helpers, loaders, who don't cross state lines, who just stay within a state. Um, they can qualify. They can qualify. There's case law out there, for example, on shuttle drivers at uh, the Miami airport who just take people uh, to the cruise ship and they can qualify even though they don't cross state lines because they are part of this continuous flow in interstate commerce. An individual starts in New York, flies to Miami to go to a cruise boat. They're continuously moving and the shuttle driver is just part of that. You can make similar arguments around truck drivers, driver helpers, loaders, but it's very fact sensitive. You get into, well, was what they were moving really part of interstate commerce or did they kind of just move to interstate commerce after, um, after the fact, after something had come to rest or stopped or changed 
or whatever the case may be. Um, next slide, please. Highly compensated employee exemption. Um, this is the last one we'll mention for the federal exemptions, um, but it's important. Essentially, what the highly compensated employee exemption says is for an employee who's paid at a sufficient level, a sufficiently high level, we're going to apply a very light or lenient duties test. So what the exemption says right now is if an employee makes at least 107 and change uh, per year, inclusive of the minimum salary, inclusive of $684 per week paid on a salary basis, then they can enter into this exemption. And all they'll ask on duties is, is the work office or non-manual in nature? Um, and do they do customarily at least one exempt duty? That exempt duty doesn't need to be the main duty, but are they doing one thing that's exempt under the EAP exemptions um, that we've talked about so far? So again, a very light duties test for employees who earn this amount, 684 per week of this $107,000 and change per year must be paid on a salary basis. But the rest can come in non discretionary pay, like commissions, bonuses, incentives, things like that. Um, next slide, and I'll turn it to Elizabeth to close us out with some state law. Oh, no, with a CLE code and then some state law variations. Yes, the, the CLE code is SS 7541. SS 7541. Uh, next slide, please. So, notable state law variations. Um, and can we have the next slide too? It's very important to check the state you're in to see what those requirements are and how they differ from the FLSA. Some of the exemptions we've talked about don't apply in certain states. So there are many states don't uh, recognize the highly compensated employee exemption. And there are states that don't recognize the computer employee exemption. And there are states that have different interpretations of some exemptions. Uh, for example, what it means to be an administrative or professional employee. Notably in California, California has very specific rules about who can be, who can meet the professional exemption in the healthcare field. Uh, so nurses in California would not generally be exempt under the professional exemption. Uh, there are some uh, exceptions, uh, you have to look at that, it's um, very specific. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, some states set higher salary thresholds. Most notably, uh, California is currently at 66560 Washington State is currently at $67,724.80. So you don't want to be paying the, the federal basis in states that have a higher threshold, or you won't meet the exemptions in that way. Uh, some states also have a quantitative primary duty test. For Again, California uh, does. So it's not enough for the employer to show um, the employee. The primary duty is not enough. You have to show that the employee is engaged in primary duties 50% of the time or more. And if the employer's uh, falling below that quantitative threshold, the employee will lose the exemption. So it's very important to watch out for these issues and make sure that you're um, meeting the requirements, uh, not just of the FLSA, but of the state you're in. And I'll turn it back to Kelly to uh, talk about future programs. Uh, thank you, uh, Elizabeth and Kevin. That was that was terrific. Um, we have uh, about uh, two minutes left. So, Kevin or Elizabeth, do you want to comment quickly on the combination exemption? Yeah, sure. I mean, the combination exemption. I feel like it comes up most often in litigation. But 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 essentially, what the combination exemption under the federal law says is, look, if you have an employee whose primary function is made up not just of executive duties, but also of administrative duties or professional duties, that we're not going to allow the fact that their primary duty is not totally within one exemption to defeat their exempt status. So you could say, look, their primary duty is, an, is a combination of executive and administrative work or professional and executive work. Um, and, and what the combination exemption says, look, you can cobble exemptions together to still maintain an, ex an exempt classification even if the employee doesn't really neatly fit into just one of those exemptions you're cobbling together. Great, thanks. And we also had a question uh, from a participant about how to determine if overtime is due if an employee works in both an exempt and a non-exempt position? Uh, that's, that's getting awfully thorny. Um, I'll, I'll start there. I mean, it, it, Typically, you're looking at what the employee is doing for their primary duty during the course of the week. I would say, like, anytime you've got an employee who's doing, who's being paid in a non-exempt capacity, 
in a given work week, paying them other hours as an exempt employee and not counting those hours toward their weekly threshold, invite some risk where you'd probably just want to talk to your counsel about making sure that you're not tripping over any, any, um, any, any major hurdles. Exactly. Got to be very fact specific. Well, to wrap up on time, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today and thank our uh, panelists for the very helpful um, information that they provided. And on the screen, I think the next slide, please, you'll see information about the our final two programs, which are on the shifting concept of employment and what is work, both of which were touched on by our presenters today. Shifting concept of employment will focus largely on independent contractor classifications, <clears throat> excuse me, and what is work will focus on that important question of when is uh, the, what what is, uh, what are hours worked? When is the, when is an employer, uh, required to pay folks for what it is exactly that they're doing. Um, so we thank you, that you uh, for joining us and hope that you'll be able to join us for some of those uh, two future sessions. Um, and on the screen, you'll also see information about um, the book uh, that our the treatise that our attorneys have authored and um, should you be interested in purchasing it. And thank you all and uh, best wishes for a tremendous 2024.